And good evening, everyone. It's uh, right about time to go ahead and start. We've got such a wonderful program ahead. I don't want us to, to get behind right off the bat. That is so exciting. I'm Jackie Hayes. I am blessed to have a job with Norton Healthcare as their manager of prevention and health marketing. But basically, I get to do events like this and to go to something like this and learn about therapies that one day could save a loved one, save our own lives. I mean, that's what it's all about. And we just want to thank all of you for being here. I think this is perhaps the largest uh, attendance we've ever had at one of these events. So we just thank you for being here. We are grateful that we can bring in literally some of the best speakers in the whole world to talk to us about cancer research. So on behalf of Norton Healthcare and the Norton Healthcare Foundation, I just want to say thank you all for being here in the Norton Cancer Institute. Um, this is the 19th Gail Klein Garlove Lectureship, which is prevented by the Norton Cancer Institute and Norton Healthcare Foundation. Isn't that awesome? Tonight's lecture, which I think has brought so many of us here because it's that hope that we are looking for, uh, putting cancer in check through immunotherapy, is all about how immunotherapy and the body's own immune system can be used or manipulated to better fight and target cancer. A couple of housekeeping notes as we get started. If you are here um, because you're working on your continuing education credits, and I know there are a lot of folks here doing that, right? Show of hands. Awesome. And I think you're going to be glad you're here. Um, they ask that I remind you uh, if you would stay through the question answer session, and then the folks will have time to get back to the table to make sure that you get your certificates. Also, physicians who are here, you've got a green paper like this. Let us know what you think about tonight's presentation because it, it matters to us uh, that you are getting information that's going to help all of us do better in our jobs, interactions with, with patients. Um, and you can turn in those forms again at the lobby, the table in the lobby. And next, got some special recognitions, recognitions to make here. Um, Kevin Wardell, I don't know where Kevin is now, but Kevin, would you stand or wave so we know where you are? Back here. We are glad that he is here. He is the Chief Administrative Officer of the Norton Cancer Institute. Lenny Meyer is also here. She is the Chief Development Officer and System Vice President of Women's and Children's Partnerships. Lenny, where are you? She was here just a minute ago. Hey, Lenny, thank you for being here. And but thanks to the Foundation for helping make this event possible. Uh, Wade Mounts, President Emeritus of Norton Healthcare. I know he's here. I saw him come in. Hello, Mr. Mounts. Glad you're here. We also have several physicians who work with the Norton Cancer Institute, and we are delighted that you are here as well. And we're especially glad to have with us the Garlove family tonight, uh, Lee and Dr. Amy Garlove and their daughter, Emery. I won't make you stand, I promise, but would you just wave the right here up front? Very good. <laughs> Dr. Matt and Dana Garlove and her mother, Trina Cox, are right up here. Thank you all. And as you know, it's because of the Garlow family that this lecture series takes place. It was a way for the children to uh, recognize and honor their parents, their mom in particular, who was diagnosed with colon cancer shortly after her husband passed away. And it's because of their generosity and their desire to honor her that this lecture series started with what, a few dozen people, some almost 20 years ago, and look at what's happening today. Please take a look at the video screens. We want to tell you a little bit more about this project. Gail <laughs> Klein Garlove was a Louisville woman known for her friendly smile, her generous nature, and her volunteer spirit. Tragically, her life was cut short by colon cancer just short of her 55th birthday. But Gail's children, family, and friends vowed that Gail and the goodness she represented would not be forgotten, which led to a lecture series. That series features physicians and scientists who are on the leading edge of cancer research and treatment. They come to Louisville to share breakthrough treatments in cancer care and technology, giving hope not only to cancer patients and their families, 
but to those who care for cancer patients every day. No one could have dreamed how big and widely supported this event would become and the difference it continues to make in so many lives. There were so many friends of my mom and our family that wanted to remember her in some way and wanted to make a contribution. And so we wanted to find something as unique as her that um, you know, they can contribute their, mother, their, their money to and that we could continue to um, do good. She was a very low-key individual, did not want any uh, spotlight on herself. So probably would appreciate that we were reaching out to people and, and, and edu hopefully educating them and just giving something back to the community. But with her name being on it, I don't think she probably would uh, really, uh, would probably say, let's, let's call it something else. We bring top flight people who are particularly, who may have made those advances themselves or are involved in teams that are advancing cancer knowledge uh, and bringing new technology to bear. Returning to Louisville, I was a little bit nervous with where would I get the latest clinical information? What would the medical community look like? This is my 10th year going, and I just have found that it's a great way to collaborate with colleagues and also learn some of the newest medical advances and new technologies. Well, we really rely heavily on our physicians in the Norton Cancer Institute to help bring us up to date on what topics are current and would be of most general interest. And they also then begin to make the contacts and identify potential speakers that they may have heard before and bring those individuals to Louisville. I find that being able to go to lectures like this in the community um, often strikes a dialogue with my patients because they've too attended the lecture and come back presenting new ideas that they've heard and it just really provides for a rich collaboration between patients um, and providers and as well between colleagues. You know, I think the volunteer effort that the Garloves give to the Norton Cancer Institute in general on many different topics, not just to this particular activity that honors their mother, but they have really reached out in a way and provided support for a lecture series that is of great value to not only, again, the professionals, but also the community, as shown just by the attendance. Um, I think I would just tell the Garloves thank you so much for your continued commitment to the Norton Healthcare community, the Louisville community, and the medical community in helping to bring these rich lectures here to us. So what do you think? Great thank you to the Garloves. I know that makes you squirm, but we are grateful for what you do. Right, Emory? It's a very good thing, so thank you. We are glad that, um, that you all do this on behalf of all of Louisville. All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Michael P Postow is a Duke graduate who got his medical degree from New York University School of Medicine. I was going through his bio and I was telling him this, his list of accomplishments is longer than my arm. So he's done a lot of things and he really looks young, but I'm like, oh gee, I guess that just happens when you've been around for a long time like me. But uh, his list of accomplishments during college is amazing. Medical school, class president, summa cum laude graduate, uh, chief fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Fellowship Program, gosh, and still working now for Sloan Kettering Cancer Center there in New York. He has published numerous articles. He is a teacher, a mentor, a clinician, a widely known researcher, his area of expertise is why we are here tonight. It's to learn how we can use new drugs, drug therapies, and procedures to help the body's own immune system to target and destroy cancer, which has affected so many people in this room. Uh, Dr. Postow's present research is to learn how immunotherapy can be used to target melanoma cells in particular, but he was telling me that in his talks tonight, he, it's broader than that. So it's not just how it could be used for treating melanoma, but other kinds of cancer as well. And I think that that's what so many of us want to hear about. Um, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dr. Michael Postow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so thank you all very much. And thank you to the Garlow family. It's uh, quite an honor to be speaking here and to be coming from New York City back to Louisville. My family is originally from the Louisville area and I grew up in Cincinnati, so it's uh, you know, nice to be a little bit back in, in the home area and to the Norton Cancer Institute as well for planning such a wonderful evening. So uh, thank you all. And uh, today's talk is really, I'm a medical oncologist that sees melanoma patients, 
But what's most important about the topic that we're going to talk about today is that the immune system, which helps fight off bacteria and viruses, actually has a very important role in fighting off cancer. And what's most important about this is it's not something that's being used just for melanoma, but really it's helping patients with many different kinds of cancers. And the talk title is called Putting Cancer in Check with Immunotherapy. And I apologize for the corny chessboard here, but uh, you'll see where the check comes in with this, some of the terminology for some of the drugs that we're using. And I'd like to walk around a little bit too, so just to, to make it a little bit more interactive. So this is my uh, mandatory disclosure slide. I've worked with some companies, but this is uh, just as an advisory unpaid position to uh, help with some of the research in this area. So in 2013, the journal called Science, which is one of the most prestigious journals in all of medical literature, indicated that cancer immunotherapy was the breakthrough of the year. And it says here, T cells on the attack. And what you can see here is a T cell, which is part of the body's own immune system, destroying a cancer cell. But the story of immune therapy and using the body's own immune system to destroy cancer didn't begin at all in 2013. In fact, it began in 1891. So raise your hand if you know who this gentleman is. I won't call on you. <laughs> so this is a big basketball area, I've heard. I've heard about the Louisville team. Uh, but anyway, so this is James Naismith. This is the inventor of basketball. And this is where he had a basketball and threw it in a peach basket. And this happened in 1891. And remarkably, that same year in 1891, that's when this gentleman also invented immune therapy, or using the body's own immune system to treat cancer. And this is a gentleman named William Coley. Anyone know about him? This is a picture from a Christmas party at Memorial Sloan Kettering in 1892, actually. Uh, it doesn't look like they were having as much fun as we were having tonight. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a, a, a good time, I guess. And what he found was that patients that had sarcomas or other kinds of cancers, when they had an infection after the surgery for their cancer, they actually found that the cancers spontaneously went away. And so it's very interesting. I, you know, some patients have a surgery for cancer, and those patients that got an infection, which was unfortunately more common in 1891 than it was today, their cancers would spontaneously get better. And so he ended up taking some of the bacterial toxins that were purified from some of these patients that had these infections and administering them to patients and came up with something called Coley's vaccine where he administered this immune therapy to patients. And uh, there's a picture of a, of a patient here. This is a, from the original publication in 1891 showing a man with a sarcoma, which is a, a tumor of the fat and soft tissues on the neck that had really dramatically improved. So this is a story as old as basketball itself. <laughs> and that should mean something to you guys. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna cover a couple main areas today, and they're going to be summarized in three main areas. How do we use the immune system to treat cancer? Certainly we do do better now than we do with infections after surgery. We don't induce infections in patients anymore. Although interestingly, a pharmaceutical company has bought the Coley's toxin and is still using that as a vaccine in some contexts. What have we learned from the clinical experience treating patients with cancer, and how do we do better? We need everyone to have the benefits that we hope for. So this is a picture of how the tumor interacts with the immune system. And when we have cancer in the body, the immune system is trying to always fight it. So you can see here on the left part of the slide are these gray cells here with these little star-like yellow things that are called antigens. And the immune system recognizes these antigens on the tumors as being somewhat foreign to the body. We're not supposed to have tumors in our body, and the immune system sees these antigens. And through a very complex system of picking up the antigen and showing it to the immune system and saying, hey, look at this, come and destroy it. T cells, which are uh, cells called lymphocytes, come out of lymph nodes, and we all know about lymph nodes, you can feel them when they get swollen when you have a viral infection or where your immune system is fighting something, and they come and they destroy the tumor. And so the immune system and the tumor are always in this tug of war, push and pull, the immune system trying to destroy the tumor with these T cells and other factors, but tumors sometimes just have sneaky ways of hiding from the immune system and not letting the immune system kill it. Otherwise, we would all destroy cancers and no one would have this, uh, this problem. 
And so the immune system and cancer are fighting punch to punch. And unfortunately, sometimes it just doesn't feel like a fair fight. <laughs> and no matter how hard the immune system is pushing here, it just, it, it's just not going to happen. And so what we need to do is we need to help this little guy out a little bit. Okay, He's working hard, but he needs to work harder. And so immune therapy strategies are ways to kick the immune system, get going, knock down this guy. No offense, he seems at least like a nice guy that he's not stepping on the other guy. So what we're doing here is using different strategies at each step along the way in the immune system to help it fight cancer. Historically, we used vaccines, like vaccines you get when you're a little kid, MMR vaccine or diphtheria vaccine. Vaccines essentially just introduce more antigen, which is uh, proteins that the immune system can recognize to hopefully wake up the immune system just to see more of the tumor. Look, there's more antigen come and destroy the tumor. Vaccines had some benefits, and I'll mention one of them in a minute, but unfortunately vaccine therapy was not as uh, effective as some of the newer strategies that we're using now. Cytokines are other types of treatments that non-specifically en enhance the immune system's function. And another way called adoptive cell transfer is just a complicated term for taking T cells directly and giving them right to the patient itself. Just taking immune system cells, these T cells that are destroying the tumor and giving them right to the patient. So we've heard of bone marrow transplantation, right? And a lot of bone marrow transplantation, at least what's called allogeneic bone marrow transplantation, is essentially just taking an immune system from one patient and bringing it to another to use the immune system to, to destroy cancer. But what's really generating a lot of enthusiasm are these antibodies called immunomodulatory antibodies. And these are ways that work directly on the T cell to help the T cells function better. So this is just one example of a vaccine. So for men that have prostate cancer, there's one vaccine called Cipulosal T that's been shown to help men live longer with metastatic prostate cancer. And this is just an example of how a vaccine approach can be used to help people live longer. Now, we wish it worked for everyone, and we know we can do better than we're doing with this vaccine, but an example of a vaccine that provides antigen uh, and in a way that the immune system can recognize it and help men with prostate cancer. And this is another approach called interleukin-2. This is a cytokine that non-specifically enhances the immune system. Has anyone watched Grey's Anatomy? Yeah, there's a hand up, good. And Izzy in Grey's Anatomy, the blonde woman, she actually had advanced melanoma in the show. And I don't want to spoil it, although I think it's a little bit old now. Uh, she ended up getting this treatment called IL-2, which is interleukin-2. And these curves essentially show that there are a group of patients, it's not as high as we would like, but there are a special group of patients that have a very profound benefit from this type of treatment. And as you can see on the curves here that are essentially flat, on the left are melanoma patients and the right are kidney cancer patients, that after a certain amount of time, patients continue to live with their cancer and uh, fortunately they don't have problems with it. So it's a very special group of people that can have a profound benefit. So we know we need to do better and some of the big exciting new drugs now are just helping the T cells function a little bit better. And so what do we need to do to make these T cells just fight a little bit harder? You remember that little guy pushing over the big sumo wrestler? These T cells are the real weapons here. They are the soldiers out on the field going in to fight battle with the tumor. And T cells, unfortunately or fortunately, have to be very tightly regulated in the body. If the immune system was too active all the time, we would turn into uh, bad autoimmune type problems. So we all know about autoimmune diseases, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis. And so that's when the immune system is acting too much and perhaps through some T cell activity, and in cancer, we believe there's too much inhibition of T cell activity. And so the T cells have turn on signals and they have turn off signals. And both are incredibly important to regulate how the equilibrium is maintained in the body. So some of the strategies that we've been using in cancer are saying, well, let's try to turn on the T cell by turning on the activating components of the T cell. And there are different antibodies, which are proteins that bind to these activating T cell targets and turn on the T cell more. But what's really driving some of the real promise now in cancer treatments are these inhibitory circuits. So by blocking the negative signal on a T cell, you can turn on the T cell as well. And so that's the same kind of analogy as saying taking off the brake of the car makes it go pretty fast. 
So the blocking targets on these T cells, they're the two that are really exciting now that are generating a lot of this enthusiasm in cancer immune therapy are two called CTLA-4 and PD-1. Okay, we, uh, you don't have to remember all the all this alphabet soup of all these different targets, but just the concept of taking the break off of the immune system is the key by blocking a negative or normally restraining mechanism on the T cell. And this just shows it in a bit of a different way. This is a T cell being activated by a cell called uh, an antigen presenting cell. And normally, an antigen presenting cell gives an antigen to a T cell and says, look at this foreign molecule, come and destroy this. And it needs another stimulatory signal to go. And CTLA-4, which is the break, blocks that go signal. And so the antibodies here, called, one's called ipilimumab and the other's called tremilimumab. And you don't have to remember the, the names are a little bit strange. Uh, but they block this target and by preventing the negative signal, turn on the T cell a little bit more. And so this just shows how it all works together. T cells get turned on by these cells and some antibodies can block that point to help turn them on a little bit better, and then they go through the lymph nodes, through the bloodstream, to the tumor site, and when they get to the tumor, they also are trying to kill the tumor, and there's another negative signal there that turns off the T cell at the tumor called PD-1, and the antibodies that work against PD-1 block right here at that last step, just before the T cell kills the tumor, and if uh, antibodies can get in the way of this interaction, the tumor does not turn off the T cell, and the T cell can t kill the tumor. So one of the problems, unfortunately, is if we block these negative signals, if we take the break off of the car for the immune system, the immune system gets a little bit overactive, and unfortunately there are side effects with this treatment. And so with the CTLA-4 target, we've had patients, unfortunately, with some rash, some diarrhea, some inflammatory liver problems, and also endocrinopathies, so inflammation of the pituitary gland or some of the other hormone glands in the body. Other people have had some arthralgias. But what's interesting, if you look at the number of patients that have really significant side effects with these types of approaches, these autoimmune-like side effects, it's relatively low uh, between you know, 10 and 25 percent in the severe category. Unfortunately, it's not zero. Uh, but when you compare it to chemotherapy, which obviously chemotherapy can, can be a wide variety of treatments, some of which are very well tolerated, some of which are, are much harder to tolerate. Uh, but um, chemotherapy also kind of has a different side effect profile than these immune therapy drugs. The immune therapy drugs don't cause you to lose your hair. Uh, it doesn't suppress your bone marrow in the same way. So instead of suppressing the immune system, like chemotherapy does, it enhances the immune system. And so these are a couple examples of some of the side effects that we can see. This is uh, one woman that we took care of. She was about uh, 75 years old, and she had melanoma involving her esophagus. And this is a picture of a rash that she had on her arm. And it's relatively faint, and also on her chest. And you can see it's not so obvious, but it was there, and it's a bit itchy. And I think that's just because when you block the, uh, take the break off these T cells, they, they react against the skin a little bit. This is a picture from a colonoscopy. This is a patient that developed an inflammatory uh, bowel problem called inflammatory colitis, and this just shows some of the inflammation in the colon. And a lot of theories exist as to why this may happen. Maybe it has to do with the uh, different bacteria in the gut, and perhaps now that we're letting the immune system wake up a little bit and see cancer a little bit more, we're also seeing other kinds of inf infectious organisms in the body, and so perhaps some of the inflammation is due to that. And this is a biopsy of the gut uh, from one of, one of the patients that developed colitis, which is the inflammation of the bowel, and you can see all these inflammatory cells. Uh, so unfortunately, these treatments don't come without a little bit of a price. This is a swelling of the pituitary gland in the brain, uh, and, and it sounds like this is, you know, all, we're starting with the bad, okay, just to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, this is uh, some inflammation of the lung. Um, but what's interesting about the side effects and what happens with the immune system is it takes a little bit of time to get activated. And so the side effects, unlike chemotherapy, where people might get treatment and feel a little bit lousy the weekend after they've been treated or maybe the next week, the treatment side effects from these immune therapies usually take a couple of weeks or months to really set in, with most not peaking until about two months until treatment uh, has begun. And so 
There are very good ways that are out there to try to manage these side effects if these occur in any patients. You can just type in the name of the drug and type in the word management and it brings you right to the page where there are very defined algorithms saying if a patient's having this side effect at this degree, this is what we need to do. And the treatment for most of this is steroids to suppress the immune system. But unfortunately, the drug can be associated with some autoimmune type side effects and we have to be careful about that. And so this is just to give in a timeline of where we, how we came to this point where we had these antibodies. And so from our uh, basic understanding of the uh, immune system when we were talking before about the turn on and turn off signals in the 1970s, it took about 20 years before we realized this would be a really good target. Then it took a little bit more time, about 10 years after that, where we first started putting patients on these large clinical trials of these drugs. And this is specifically the drug ipilimumab, which targets that one uh, break mechanism on the T cell called CTLA-4. And it was in 2010 and 2011 where the drug was finally proven to help people live longer with cancers, and specifically melanoma. And it was approved by the FDA because it was the first drug in a phase three randomized study in melanoma to help patients live longer. And so to give an idea of how long this process really took, I just put some technology up on the screen here to see just, wow, remember when and what people might have been using at the time. So first, there were these phones that looked something like this back in the 1970s when we were first starting to figure this out. Uh, and over time, we went to more phones, maybe something like in the you know, 1980s or 90s with these uh, or early cell phones or car phones, if any of us remember that. Uh, then to flip phones, a little bit more fancy, uh, around the time the clinical trials were really beginning, and now the iPhone. And actually, this is a little bit dated. I apologize on that. There's the new iPhone 6. Uh, but, but the point is, look how far we've come in some areas, and, and really just going from a basic understanding of the immune system in the 70s to where we have a drug that's now approved that helps people live longer with melanoma. And these are the curves from one of the studies that uh, was conducted where it showed patients that had uh, advanced melanoma lived longer when they got this drug called ipilimumab, which turns on the T cells by blocking the break, uh, that they had a long-term survival in a subset of patients. Now, we wish it wasn't, a, uh, we wish this curve was higher. We wish this was 100% of patients, but it was an improvement from other historical control. And what we know is that there are more people that are helped from this drug than the traditional response rate of the drug, meaning it's not just about the tumors shrinking on a CAT scan. There's something more about this by turning on the immune system that helps people live longer because more than twice the number of people had the long-term survival than uh, actually responded to the drug in the traditional way of a response. And this is an example of a patient that we took care of. He's a, a grandfather now um, and actually just, just became a grandfather. Uh, in 2006, this is his liver here, and you can see his liver over time, unfortunately, despite this drug, developed a lot of melanoma in it. You can see all these little black uh, dots in the liver. So a couple weeks into treatment, it didn't look like it was working very well. And what happened is over time, with ongoing treatment, and in just a bit more time, by week 20, so a little bit less than six months, you can see the liver lesions were regressing, and by week 36, they were still regressing. So some of these treatments take a little bit of time, and it's very curious, why was this going on so early? Was it that it just took time for the drug to kick in? Was it maybe that the immune system itself was trying to fight the tumors here, and maybe it looked like the tumors were getting worse, but really it was just the immune system getting activated and fighting in the tumors? We're still trying to figure these things out, but there are a percentage of patients that have this kind of initial period of apparent worsening and ultimate benefit. And so we've kind of reevaluated the way that we look at CAT scans and think about this because it's not a treatment that goes and destroys a tumor directly. It's a treatment that enhances your own body to seek and destroy the tumor. So it does take a little bit of time. And so when we think about the different targets, this is the one target we talked about, CTLA-4. And we want to know, well, how does this work? Why is it, uh, what can we look at to see who might be benefiting from this and who might not be benefiting? And if we remember that T cells are lymphocytes, that get targeted. We've found that patients that got the drug ipilimumab compared to patients that got the control arm, which is a vaccine in this particular study, the lymphocyte count went up. And so we can see that this treatment directly activates the lymphocytes to proliferate. And even though patients before treatment were having declining values of lymphocytes, over time with the treatment, it caused 
lymphocytes to proliferate and to increase in number. And so that we think might be related because we also know that patients that have a high degree of change or a great degree of proliferation have a little bit better outcomes with this drug than those that don't. So we're trying to understand what are the targets of this drug, how can we understand who it's working for and who it's not working for, what are the signals and signs that are happening to tell us for sure that the immune system is being activated, and this is one of the ways that we're looking at it. And we're also looking at the tumor because we think, well, maybe the tumor itself might be more immunogenic. Maybe certain tumors might respond better to this. This drug has shown promise in melanoma and to a degree in lung cancer as well. But uh, in a big prostate cancer study, the results weren't uh, necessarily as good, unfortunately. And some people believe that in addition to helping the good guys fight better by taking the break off of them and helping them go a little bit more, it also deletes some of these bad guys in the tumor called T regulatory cells. And these T regulatory cells hang out in the tumor and they kind of prevent good T cells from coming into the tumor and destroying them. And so what we can see here is that the target of this drug, ipilimumab, also is expressed on T regulatory cells, the bad suppressive immune system cells. And what happens over time is this antibody can bind to them as well and recruit other cells to the tumor that ultimately destroy them. And by removing the bad ones from the tumor, then the, the good T cells can come and destroy it a little bit better. This has been shown in animal models. We haven't yet gotten enough data from clinical studies to really prove this mechanism, but this is one of the theories on how this drug works. So by enhancing the good T cells and by removing some of the bad ones that are in the tumor. So if we remember back to how does the T cell go and destroy a tumor, we can see that there's the early step here, then the cells go through the bloodstream, get to the tumor, and try to destroy it at the tumor. But unfortunately, the tumors are tricky, and the tumors have this signal called PD-1, or PDL1, and this interaction turns off the T cell normally. And some antibodies that have been developed now block this interaction so T cells can destroy the tumors a little bit better. And there have been a number of different antibodies. This is just a, a complicated table, but just to show you how many different companies, how many different targets are being targeted now in this particular area. And so this is a, just to show eight different molecules over the last handful of years have come forward in this area of blocking this negative signal, which is called a checkpoint, an immune system checkpoint. And this is an example of a patient that had a very big lung tumor and some fluid and additional tumor here and some uh, tumor in the liver here on the bottom. This is a melanoma patient. And so this is a scan that was done, a CAT scan that was done in April of 2012. This is a CAT scan a year later, essentially, after one of the antibodies that prevents, that, that enhances the immune system this way. So you could see that these aren't necessarily just small tumors that are going away with this approach. These are very massive tumors in the liver and in the lung. And so this can work to a very, very profound degree. And perhaps this target, the PD-1 target, may be even more uh, effective than the first target that we were talking about. And we're still doing research to truly prove that hypothesis. And so this is to show, show, we had a theory in oncology for a long time that particular cancers were somewhat more immunogenic than others. We had always used different immune therapies for kidney cancer and, and melanoma and some hematologic cancers and, and bone marrow transplant is an example of that. However, what we've seen now with this new group of agents called these PD-1 drugs, there are many tumor types that we're showing some efficacy in now that we never saw before uh, at least that was never really tested in a significant amount. So we've seen people with non-small cell lung cancer have good results, ovary cancer, head and neck cancer, and other solid tumors as well. So we're still trying to see how this can work in other cancers, but it's not just melanoma. And so this is a woman, this is a 96-year-old woman, okay? And so that's not a patient that you would necessarily think right off the bat about giving heavy, heavy-duty chemotherapy to, uh, but you know, perhaps depending on how her um, functional status is, uh, one could consider other kinds of treatments. And this is uh, a woman, 96, she progressed on prior cetuximab, which is another treatment for head and neck cancer. And this is a head and neck cancer right here under her jaw. And you can see a big tumor here, and actually just after four weeks on treatment, you can see that this is dramatically improving with an antibody that blocks this uh, negative regulatory T cell target. 
And you can see that she's a little happy about that. You can see that little smile? Maybe a little bit there, somewhat subtle, but, but there. And this is bladder cancer. All right, this is not just about melanoma. I, I see patients with melanoma, but I'm very pleased that this is expanding and expanding to other different tumor types. We just saw a patient with head and neck cancer with a tumor on her cheek. This is what's called a spider plot. It's a bit uh, tricky to see all the lines here, uh, but what's important to know is looking on the horizontal axis is time, and on the y-axis is tumor. And so patients, unfortunately, that go up here are ones that had their bladder cancer get worse over time. But what's remarkable about one of the, you know, another one of these agents is by giving an antibody that turns on the immune system in this way, a number of patients have shrinkage of their bladder cancer here. And what's even rem more remarkable about that is you can see that the patients that have shrinkage, it stays down. These patients are not sh going down and going back up like a roller coaster. It doesn't get much better and then unfortunately the tumors progress. This seems to stay down. Now this is still a little bit short follow-up. This is all less than a year. This is time and days here. This is less than a year, but we know with more time, we hope that these continue to be longer lasting. And this is a patient with lung cancer. This is again the same principles we were talking about before with the other target, the CTLA-4 target, with the PD-1 target. Classic responses can be delayed in a number of these patients as well. This is a patient before treatment. This is a CAT scan showing lungs. This arrow is pointing to a little area in the lung that was uh, lung cancer. After two months on treatment, you can see that these areas got a little bit worse, a little bit bigger. But by four months, it was getting better. And that was just with continuing the same treatment. So it's not clear. Is that just because the tumors were growing, or is that because really it just was the immune system? Maybe if we remove this, it was just a ball of inflammatory cells around a shrinking tumor. We don't quite know that. We need to do more studies. But again, an interesting principle. So all of this is with the goal of just trying to help people live longer. Quality of life and quantity of life are really essentially the goals of all of medicine. And we don't have a lot of data yet from randomized studies with at least the PD-1 agents where we can say for sure, compared to standard agents, these have shown improved overall survival as of yet. But early data from large phase one studies, which are first in human experiences with these antibodies, shows that it's very, very promising. This is a curve for melanoma patients, and it really shows people are, th this is a, a curve that we haven't really seen before in terms of the number of people that are living for a long period of time with melanoma. Um, prior curves, unfortunately, didn't look as good as this. Now, again, we wish this were, were all patients that were having this kind of benefit, but it certainly is a big, big step in the right direction. With the PD-1 drugs, just like with the CTLA-4 drugs, unfortunately there are some side effects. And I think the key, though, is if you look on the right column, this, the percentage of significant side effects is only about 10 percent. It's 12.6 percent in this. And most of them are relatively acceptable. So rash, we know rash is not a comfortable thing. It can be itchy. It can be painful. But fortunately, in almost all cases, it's not dangerous. And we can give creams to help the rash. Itch. Um, and, and some of the other types of things we talked about, like lowering of the thyroid function or uh, a little bit of liver inflammation. So these are things we need to be mindful of, but by recognizing them early and managing them with steroids or other immune suppressive treatments, we can certainly help people get through the side effects so they can have the benefits in a number of the CAT scans and other things like I showed. So we want to know, well, who is benefiting from PD-1. What can we look at? We looked at the lymphocytes before, and I showed you how they went up in the patients that got the drug, and that seemed to associate with better outcomes in, in one of the big randomized phase three studies. What we want to know is what is, it, what is special about some of these patients that have the tumor shrink right away, and why do other people not have any benefit at all? And so we've looked at this marker on the tumors themselves called PD-L1. PD-L1 is that negative thing that the tumors use to try to kill the immune system when the immune system is trying to kill the tumor. And this is something called, uh, this is a, called an immunohistochemical stain, but essentially it takes a stain and looks at how much of this PD-L1 is present in the tumor. And this is a tumor where there's nothing there. This is a tumor where there's a lot there. You can see all the brown coloring. And so what we've seen from a number of the studies is that the patients that have a lot of this marker there, so a lot of the brown, 
seem to do a little bit better with the drug for some reason. Now, we don't know if it's because that marker is exactly what's important or maybe that marker is just a marker of a tumor that's a bit more immunogenically offensive to the immune system and that allows the immune system to destroy it a little bit better. Uh, we do know, though, that there doesn't seem to be a difference in survival between the patients that have the marker and that don't have the marker, at least in patients with lung cancer. And we're still trying to understand uh, what this actually really means in terms of response, because we know that patients that don't have the marker can still have a really profound benefit to the drug as well. So PD-L1 is the marker like we talked about. And one thing I will tell you, for many of us who take care of patients with cancer, we want to know about different aspects of the tumor in terms of what do we know about its biology. And it's different. This immune system biomarker is different than markers like HER2 in breast cancer. Many of us have heard of trastuzumab or Herceptin. Many of us have heard about the estrogen receptor, people that have taken tamoxifen or other aromatase inhibitors, or KRAS in colon cancer. But this is different from those. Unlike these, which are genetic problems with the tumor itself or amplifications of the gene, this is an immune system marker that the tumors can upregulate and downregulate. Maybe different tumors have more of that brown marker than others. And so it's very, very complex to try to understand which patients we should use for this marker. And I don't think this is a marker we're going to be able to say, patient, Mr. Jones, you're going to get this drug, and Ms. Smith, you're not going to get this drug. This is something that's just telling us more about the biology. And so when we think about the immune system and trying to find ways that we can do better, one, we want it to be personalized. We want it to be just applied to the people that it's going to help. But it's not quite that simple, as we were just talking about. If we think about it, we all want to match the right drug to the right patient. And so if you have a square peg, it's not going to work with the round hole, and that's not going to be a good fit. But what's interesting about the immune system is it's not just a static drug. It's not a drug that goes in and destroys a tumor. It can be molded in different ways and tweaked in different ways with different combinations of treatment so that maybe the square peg can be changed to a circle to help fit with this particular patient. The other thing is this tumor itself, if we think about this as the patient, we may be able to have ways that we can make the tumor more immunogenic so it can be recognized by the immune system in, in a better way than it would be otherwise. And so we're starting to investigate combinations. If one drug gives us some good, do two drugs give us even more benefit? And one of the combinations that's been explored is using radiation treatment, which is a big part of cancer treatment, and combining it with the immune system drugs because we do believe that radiation can have beneficial immunogenic effects. And so mouse models have shown in the laboratory that radiation can enhance the immune system's ability to kill tumors. And we've had a couple patients. This is one uh, patient here. If you look on the left side of the slide, in August of 2009, she was a 43-year-old mother of two who had melanoma that had metastasized to an area around her lung, this lymph node in the middle panel, and this place in the back here. And over time, you can see that the little melanoma in the back started to grow, and it started to grow even more. And there were some areas in the spleen that got worse. The spleen is in this red circle. And over time, even though we were giving the one drug, the ipilimumab drug that takes the break off the immune system, the melanoma continued to worsen. Unfortunately, she was not one of the patients that has initial apparent worsening and then improvement. It continued to worsen. And such that the back pain got to be so significant, she needed radiation to this area. Got radiation to this area, and the tumor that was irradiated got better. But what was also very interesting in this just one patient example was that tumors outside of the area that was irradiated actually started to shrink. So this was something we think in this one patient, and I know it's just one patient, we really need to do a, a clinical trial to prove this, but this is just an interesting observation that when you gave radiation in this one patient, it seemed to enhance the immune system such that other tumors outside of that area began to shrink. And we can't really recommend radiation just with this hypothesis in mind for all patients, but it was an interesting observation that's led to a number of other clinical trials. And this was a patient with a little, you see this little um, dot here in the brain. This is a brain metastasis from melanoma here uh, in the middle panel on the top that got radiation. And this big area in the lung here actually got better after the radiation was given in the brain than this other patient. So we've seen a couple of patients uh, been described in the literature where giving radiation seems to have enhanced the efficacy of this drug. And again, we're doing trials to really prove this. It's not yet proven. 
Other people say, well, what if we just combine these? Maybe and it's not radiation. Maybe we should just give two of these antibodies together, the one antibody that uh, helps enhance the T cell early on and the other antibody that helps it when it's just fighting the tumor. And this is a study where we combine both of them. And you can see here, this is, again, the same kind of what's called a spider plot. Many, many patients in this group here, it was a phase one study, had very profound benefit. You could see the tumor shrinking in the majority of them. And then that did seem to last for quite a number of uh, months in many of these patients. And this is a waterfall plot, which essentially shows you every line down on the plot is a patient whose tumor had shrunk by a certain percentage. And you can see a lot of patients with pretty good tumor shrinkage when you've combined these two drugs together. And so really trying to think maybe one is not enough. Maybe we need both. Maybe we need better ways that we can decide who will benefit enough from the one drug and who really needs both. And so we're trying to really understand these concepts a little bit more. And so I want to summarize and have a few questions just to and get a discussion going that blocking these checkpoints or these negative Regulator, regulatory circuits on T cells has really been a proof of concept of a new way of using the immune system to treat cancer. It's shown improved survival in melanoma patients, and it's showing dramatic tumor shrinkages in a number of patients. We've seen the patient with the head and neck cancer with the tumor shrink. We've seen some liver lesions get better. In melanoma patients, we've seen some lung cancer throughout this talk that has shrunk. In many of these cancers, it's remarkable of the durability that this can last for months and months and months and in years and years and years in some cases, that this is not something that just happens for a few weeks and then goes away. We know that biomarkers, which is how are we going to understand what we're doing? Who do we know we should give this to and who should we not give this to? They don't yet inform treatment selection, so we cannot tell a patient you don't have a green tumor, you're not going to get this drug. So that, that's not where we are with this yet, but we're trying to understand what does it mean to have a green tumor or a blue tumor in terms of response to immune treatment. And we're starting to learn, it's very early, we're starting to learn whether or not combinations of different traditional cancer treatments like chemotherapy and immune therapy could be used together. Maybe we should be thinking about radiation and immune therapy. Maybe we should just be putting multiple immune therapies together. We're starting to learn maybe we need to do one of those strategies. That might help more people, and we, we don't know yet. And so what are the future questions? Where are we going with all this? If you remember the T cell here that we used in the beginning that was our soldier on the ground that came down from the lymph node to come and destroy the tumor that could get turned on or turned off by different tricks, we target the negative ones. That's what we've been talking about today. But look how many there are, and this is just a few of them. What about targeting some of the go signals and blocking some of the stop signals? What about multiple blockages of stop signals? Maybe that's where we're going to go, and that's where a lot of different clinical studies are being conducted. So what are the next hot targets? Also, what does the FDA need to see to say this drug is a good one and I want to approve it so we can get access to more patients? And when we're designing the clinical trials, we're trying to figure out how do we need to show a benefit of this drug? Because some of these benefits are not in the standard way that tumors just shrink some of this is in these other weird ways, like I was describing. It takes a long time. Maybe it's an atypical type of response. So what do we need to do to prove that this is going to be a better way? And we're still working on that. And then can using these immune therapies that enhance the function of T cells help with other types of cancer treatment and other tumor types? And so I think that this is starting to spread through a lot of different kinds of cancers. And I think cancer is one of those diseases that unfortunately touches all of us in a different way. We all have a loved one. Or, or someone we cared about or we've cared for them if we're one of the clinical people. And, and immune therapy is something that's becoming a bigger deal. And so I encourage everyone to talk with their doctors about uh, whether or not this is an appropriate treatment. Now, this is not yet proven in all diseases, and I don't want to give a, a you know, misinformation that this is the best treatment for all cancers. However, this is something that is demonstrating a lot of promise and may make sense in a particular patient's course uh, with their disease. And so if we think about it, you know, we've made a lot of progress since 1891. 2013, science said that this is the biggest breakthrough of the year. And perhaps around here, people are a little bit more happy with this guy. <laughs> OK, so just want to thank everyone again. And I want to give some time for questions. It's a real big honor to be here, to have such a great attendance, uh, and to speak with you on such an exciting topic in all of cancer treatment. So thank you again.
Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Wardell uh, with the Norton Cancer Institute. I, I, too, this is, crowd is astonishing. I've been to, I think, 10 of these. Uh, and this is half again as large an audience as we've had for any of them. So uh, we really appreciate it. It's a wonderful event. And we're learning about some very important new things. We have time for some questions. Uh, we do have some of our, because we were not able to get everyone in this room, we have a, some individuals in the back room who have been watching this on, through the miracle of modern technology, video technology. And they also, would there'll be a microphone back in, the, in that room as well if anyone there has any questions, and we'll be on the lookout for that. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and we will bring a microphone to you. And Kevin, we'll go from there. I have one there. back here. I have one in the back. I was just diagnosed with lung cancer, and they put me on the Tarceva, and I was just curious as what you think about the, that drug. It's 150 milligrams. Okay, so a question about Tarceva for lung cancer. So uh, I'm a melanoma medical oncologist, so I don't want to speak specifically about Tarceva. Tarceva is a, a drug that blocks something called EGFR, and that is a common type of um, problem in some lung cancers. And uh, one of the things that I'll have to mention is that the kind of strategy like Tarceva is a targeted treatment that goes directly to target the tumor. And one thing we're trying to study in lung cancer and others is combining drugs like Tarceva that targets that EGFR problem in lung cancer with the immune therapy drugs. Uh, there are immune therapy drugs that have also shown promise in lung cancer, and so there are some studies where we're combining drugs like Tarceva with uh, the immune therapy drugs, and we're hopeful that that will also show very much promise. Um, so uh, a good example of targeted therapy directed directly against the tumor with immune therapy, and whether or not that it, really helps Tarceva function better is still a subject of ongoing study. Question, Judy? You want to grab, get a microphone over here? Do you foresee this type of treatment being used mainly for patients who have been diagnosed in the early stages or in all stages? So it's a great question about where in the course of the disease is this, these immune treatments going to be best. So the way that they've come forward has been mostly so far in patients with more advanced disease or metastatic disease that has spread, because that's been the area where we've studied them the most so far and have shown their benefits. But our hope is that the drugs that have shown benefit in that situation will show benefit in earlier stages of the disease, like in adjuvant treatment where someone's had a surgery to remove a tumor. We hope that by adding these drugs to other treatments like chemotherapy or even by giving these drugs by themselves, that it helps reduce the risk of recurrence for some of the tumors that can come back after surgery, unfortunately. And so we've shown the benefits in the metastatic setting. We're still studying them in the adjuvant setting or earlier on. I'm hopeful that we'll see the same benefits there. Over here, over there. Thank you, Dr. Postel. That was extremely interesting, and I look forward to the future information about this. But my question is about your one patient that seemed to do worse and that lesion in her back had to have radiation. Mm -hmm. We're radiation therapists. Mm -hmm. um, so it made me think that could that patient just have, had she not had the back pain and needed the radiation, could it have just that the lesions elsewhere regressed because it was enough time? Right, it's a, it's a great question, and it's one actually that uh, the reviewers for the paper asked us when we submitted this as well. So you're, you're right on exactly the topic. Okay, I'm glad you weren't reviewing this paper too. Um, but it's a very good, good question about, you know, we were talking about you have delayed benefit from this drug. So could this have just been a delayed benefit from the drug itself, and maybe the radiation just happened to have nothing to do with it? It's, it's possible, absolutely. Now, the time course for this particular patient, um, it was well over a year before that happened. And so though we've seen some of these patients who have this initial progression and ultimate benefit, usually that happens on the matter of months or you know, maybe six months or eight max. So the time course was quite long. We kept treating her with the drug because we said, oh, things are getting worse, but she's feeling fine. Let's hope for a late benefit. And we kept hoping for the late benefit and hoping, and it never happened. So a year and a half or something into it, that's when she got the radiation and just a few months after the radiation, this benefit was achieved. Did she bring radiation? Absolutely, yeah. So we, we are doing studies where we're 
testing does radiation add to this in a more rigorous way? Absolutely. Uh, breast cancer is a very common uh, tumor. Is, uh, any studies uh, related to immunotherapy to breast cancer? So uh, breast cancer is absolutely a, a huge issue in our society uh, with the number of people that are affected with it. And these drugs, the PD-1 class of drugs, the latter group that I was speaking of, that is being investigated in breast cancer. And there are some very early trials that have shown uh, some very early data on it. So I cannot necessarily comment yet on the efficacy in terms of percentages or, or uh, you know, improving survival and things in breast cancer. It's a little bit early days, but our hope is that the efficacy we've seen in melanoma, kidney cancer, and lung cancer will be extrapolated to breast cancer as well because it's such, an, uh, such a societal problem. I'm in a phase one trial with IL-10 mm -hmm. and carboplatin and taxol, mm -hmm. and I saw you mentioned IL-2, but I didn't hear anything about IL-10. What, how, how do those two compare? Or right, so IL-10 is another cytokine like uh, IL-2. They have a bit different function, and it is another immune therapy strategy. IL-10 is a cytokine, as I'm sure has been explained. IL-2 is more of the, um, is a bit older in terms of the studies that have been done with IL-2, some of the studies that have been done, but I think the principles are similar in that we hope that by administering cytokines that that helps the immune system wake up and, you know, wake up, look what's going on here, we need to do a better job than we're doing. And in some of the studies where we're combining chemotherapy with immune therapy, I think the traditional thinking that chemotherapy was always immunosuppressive. There are some studies that suggest it could be immunostimulatory in certain contexts, and so there are still some studies that combine chemotherapy with these immune therapies, and so our hope is that they could work together, but certainly very early. We're just making sure it's safe to do first, yeah. Any other questions out there? Well, it's, it's wonderful, to, no, wonderful to have Dr. Postow here with us. We do have a gift for him. It's a vase that uh, oh, we traditionally give to speakers for the the Garlove Lecture, for me, it's always a great pleasure to give this to a fellow Blue Devil. <laughs> and uh, we'll send that oh, to thank, you. Thank you very much. All right, I guess so. Good. Okay, thank you. For those of you who are here for prefer professional education, uh, please remember to complete your evaluations as part of that form. For the rest of you, please Absolutely. stay safe on your drive home tonight, and it's been great to see you. Thank you, and thank you to the Garlove family once again.